episode 280, Kim Iverson. Kim Iverson, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be back. Yeah, thank you so much for being back on and helping me kick off my 10th season. I really do appreciate it. And obviously, there's a lot in the news right now, so there's a lot to cover. But the breaking news over the last few days has been what's been happening in Lebanon. And Israel at first uh, attacked uh, pagers that folks there had, causing some real havoc, um, not just amongst uh, Hezbollah, but amongst the civilian population. There was reports of children being killed. The following day, there was other attacks. Then there's also uh, been bombing as well. So it's just been day after day of attacks on Lebanon. And we've seen a lot of um, sort of apologism for these attacks in the media, especially amongst conservative commentators. So just wondering if you kind of give us your thoughts overall on what Israel is doing here. And then, again, all, there's been a lot of discussion around how they were able to carry out these pager and uh, walkie-talkie attacks. Right. I mean, it's very sophisticated what they were able to pull off. And I think that was the point, is that they wanted to showcase their ability and how they can um, basically infiltrate anywhere at any time. What they've done is an act of terror from my viewpoint. And the reason it's an act of terror is because these were, they argue that this was not indiscriminate, that this was extremely targeted, that they only installed these explosives in Hezbollah issued pagers and other devices that only would end up in the hands of Hezbollah. I would agree with them that it would be a targeted strike, uh, very discriminate targeting, if and only if they were they were detonating each explosive one by one, knowing where the combatant was or the militant was, who they were with at the time. If they knew that, rather than just pushing a button and all of them going off at the same time or however they did it, sending a message that detonated all of the explosives at once or within a short period of time one, of one another. Had they gone and done it one by one, then maybe I think people would say, wow, that was actually quite sophisticated. And, um, you know, that's that that brings warfare to a whole different ball game. I mean, for one, it's terrifying because it's bringing war. It, the way they're conducting warfare now has changed that this changes everything. Um, so that's terrifying. What makes it an act of terror is the fact that they just let, they just detonated all of the explosives and they weren't thinking about where each person was, nor did they really truly verify that the person holding the pager was actually Hezbollah. Um, one of the, one of the pieces of evidence that makes us think they weren't 100% certain is the fact that now this could have just been coincidental, but the fact that American doctors who were in Beirut had their pagers switched out two weeks prior to this pager detonation. So were they carrying these issued pager, pagers? Was it a worry that they might be carrying these issued pagers? Is that why they were swapped out only two weeks ago? That leads me to believe that Israel did not check and verify each individual who ended up with one of these pagers. But what we saw in this detonation is that civilians were harmed in this. So they weren't caring at all about who the person was around, where they were. They were at the grocery store or the little girl that was blown up. You know, she was carrying the pager to her dad because the pager went off at the, you know, in the kitchen or wherever she was. So they they weren't actually targeting one by one. We get very upset in this country, like, for example, when uh, they droned in Afghanistan, they were dr they droned. It turned out a family of ten. They said that it was a the, the guy was a terrorist. Turned out he wasn't a terrorist at all. But even if he was a terrorist, the talk around it was, does it does that allow you to then blow up nine children because this guy was carting around all these kids and you thought he was a terrorist? Does that justify the killing of these nine children to take out the one terrorist? And I think the sentiment in America is no. Uh, and that was considered a failure by the Biden administration. Of course, these same conservatives who were happy to rail against Biden when he makes a mistake droning 10 children or nine children, uh, they're now the same people that say, well, I mean, if you're the child of a terrorist, this is what you get. You know, this is it's your fault that your parent is the terrorist of some. And, and so you deserve to die is essentially their sentiment. Um, but I think you know, the biggest issue around this and why it's an act of terror 
is not only was it indiscriminate when they actually detonated each of the explosives, but the fact that they're able to go into a country they're not in at war with and uh, and and attack their citizens and their people whom they label as terrorists. And some of the people that they targeted were just uh, diplomats. I mean, they went after an Iranian ambassador. That is not a militant. Who did they who did they classify as Hezbollah? Hezbollah is a political. It's also a political uh, branch. So were they going after politicians or were they going after specifically military targets? It doesn't look like they were just going after military targets. But furthermore, Israel has labeled student protesters here in the United States as terrorists. Does this get their, their state official Twitter account literally called the student protesters in the United States terrorists? They said, quote, they are terrorists. So if they're going to label student protesters in the United States as terrorists, does that give them the green light to implant explosives in the in the uh, cell phones of student protesters? The United States government has labeled Catholics as terrorists, uh, J6 protesters as terrorists, um, MAGA people, right, as terrorists, student parents that go to parent teacher meetings as terrorists people who were against COVID mandates as terrorists. They've labeled all of these people as terrorists. And when that definition can change and they're able to just now target people using our cell phones, I mean, that should frighten every last one of us. A lot of people are saying, well, I'm not scared because I'm not a terrorist. I'm not Hezbollah. I'm not a terrorist. Well, you're not a terrorist today, but you're somebody's terrorist tomorrow. So by these definitions. So this should be terrifying to all of us. The fact that they could just infiltrate and get into our devices like this, the fact that they can go into a country they're not at war with and and enact this mass terrorism plot, the fact that they could just label anybody as a terrorist and go after them, um, the fact that – and it's not just about Israel. They've now opened up Pandora's box on this. What about our other adversaries? Who are they going to be going after? Are they going to be targeting us here in the United States? This should frighten everybody who labels China as a as an enemy state, which is most of the Republican Party, right? Is the the talking points of China is an enemy. We get all of our electronics from China. So that should frighten everybody at this point that Israel has opened up this Pandora's box of the new form of warfare. And, you know, it seems as though if you look at the last year, Israel has been continually escalating because, uh, you know, just the uh, onslaught that happened in Gaza and the uh, the relentless bombing and the fact that, you know, there was calls internationally to reach some kind of ceasefire and that has not been reached. You had the assassination that uh, took place in Tehran and now you have these attacks in Lebanon. It really seems as though uh, Netanyahu and the Israeli government are trying to expand this into an all-out regional war. And, uh, you know, one has to suspect that that would also pull in the United States. You know, we sent some aircraft carriers there. So it just, you know, from my perspective, looks as though Israel wants war with Iran and the U.S. is going to get dragged into it. Yeah, luckily, um, Iran is not taking the bait. I mean, wow, some real self-restraint that that country is showing by not reacting. I'm curious if they're going to react after this, after these latest terror attacks. Um, if I were advising them, I would say do not, do not engage. This is what they want. They're clearly looking for um, an escalation. That is what their aim is. They want to go to war. They've been itching for war for a long time with Iran and Lebanon and Syria. You know, they want to, they want to expand this into a wider war. So, uh, it, you know, Iran has been extremely measured in their responses. I would encourage them to continue to be measured because the worst thing that anything, the worst thing that could happen is a wider war. At this point, Israel's destroying itself. So why intervene? You know, if you're Iran right now and you're looking at them and they're doing all of these terror attacks on you, they're they're ultimately um, destroying themselves. They've destroyed their credibility around the world. Their economy is suffering. If you keep Israel in the position they're in right now cornered, they're going to continue to do these attacks and these that that really don't have any other um, gain, right, for Israel. I mean, if you don't re if you don't react to it, there's no gain for Israel in this. 
So allow them to remain cornered and scratching their trying to claw their way out. That's, I think, the best strategy for them. I hope that they maintain that strategy because the last thing I would like to see is for us to be dragged into a war that Israel has dragged us into. And the only thing keeping us out of it at this point is the measured reaction from Iran. And at the same time, what we've seen domestically is it seems as though there's a heavy push to uh, implicate Iran into some kind of wrong, wrongdoing around the election. So we had the report that Donald Trump's campaign was hacked and information was sent to the Biden campaign uh, or the Biden administration, and that was done by Iran. We also had some rhetoric right after the first Trump assassination attempt that Iran was plotting some assassination. Uh, Ryan Routh, who uh, you know went to Ukraine, and you know there's a lot of questions around his involvement there in Ukraine. Uh, in the book that he wrote, uh, he mentioned Iran, uh, so there's you know trying to tie that to, to Iran as well. So yeah, it seems as though there's really a heavy push to make Republicans and Donald Trump very hawkish against Iran, as if they you know, need any any extra pushing there. But um, that's a lot of the rhetoric that we've seen, and, and especially with this hacking uh, narrative, it almost seems like the inverse of RussiaGate. You know, where it was alleged that Russia hacked the 2016 election, we're being told that Iran is uh, hacking the the Trump campaign. So I'm just wondering what your your thoughts are on on the reports around that hack. Yeah, it's very similar to the Russia Russia Gate hack uh, story or Russia Gate influence story that Democrats pushed. And look at how well it's worked out for Democrats. Um, the in, in that they've been able to gaslight their entire voting base into hating Russia and wanting war with Russia and wanting to oust Putin. So a party that had been historically anti-war, you know, the voting base had been more hesitant about war is now suddenly foaming at the mouth towards Russia. Uh, anything to support Ukraine. Let's give Ukraine anything and everything. And the the Ukrainian civilians are the ones who are harmed. They're being drafted into this war. They're being massacred. It's it's terrible. And there's really no win for Ukraine in this. Um, so clearly they saw how well that worked. And now they're saying, you know, the, the military industrial complex, the powers that be that love war and those that want to see war with Iran are taking that playbook and saying, oh, hey, let, let's use this now and say the same things about Iran and let's really get the American public against Iran. Let's get them to foam at the mouth and want war because they're interfering with us or they're harming us in some way. And, you know, if Joe Biden, win, I mean, uh, Kamala Harris wins, you know, they'll blame it on Iran so that uh, to make it sound like, um, you know, in, in order to demonize Iran, in order to get us to hate Iran. So I do think that there's definitely a really suspicious narrative that is being pushed. The thing that frightens me the most is I don't think any of this is going to work. And I think that as the Israelis realize it's not going to work, what they know does work and what has worked every single time in U.S. history is America being attacked. So that is my concern is that it will escalate to the point where the U.S. gets attacked, where there's a, a false flag event and it's blamed on Iran or Hezbollah or whoever. And um, and we end up at war because American civilians are dead from some sort of an attack. That's my biggest concern. And again, you know, these assassination attempts that we've seen against Trump, they've been very odd. Um, you know, we had the, the first case of crooks where we still don't really have an explanation of you know, what his motivation was. Um, you know, you and also in the case of Ryan Routh, you've had people on both sides claiming, oh, he supported Republicans in the past. He supported Democrats in the past. But um, obviously he was a very Routh was a very strange character. He went to Ukraine. He uh, you know, we don't know. He may have had uh, connections there with you know, Ukrainian government or intelligence or U.S. intelligence or military. We don't know if he received any kind of military training. Uh, again, it seemed as though he, uh, at least at the very least, really bought into this Ukraine propaganda. And again, he wrote about marching to Moscow and burning down the Kremlin. Um, so he's he's a very odd guy. Obviously, you know he's um, he's being tried currently, or he's having you know the, the charges put against him currently. So everything right now is is just sort of uh, allegations. But again, he seems as though a very odd character. So just wondering if you have any kind of thoughts on that. I don't know if you've you know, looked into his social media before it was taken down or maybe the book that he wrote, but um, just if you have any kind of thoughts on that, the second Trump assassination attempt. Um, you know, there's just a lot of speculation, obviously, at this point. I mean, what we do know is everything that you just listed is that he was very hyper pro-Ukraine to, you know, a, a, an extreme level. And obviously being at that level and going over to Ukraine and fighting and recruiting, he had contacts within the government for sure. 
So, um, in or so, so there's from there. Those are the facts that we know. From there, we can then deduce that it was one of two things. Uh, either he was just totally, totally deranged about Ukraine. He saw that there was a previous assassination attempt and thought, "Good idea. Uh, I hate this guy, and if he gets in office, he's going to end this war that that this guy had dedicated his life to, literally, and was willing to die for, literally, right?" So it very well could have been he was just um, thinking, wow, great idea. And I think this is the only way to stop this guy from ending this war. And maybe that was a genuine feeling of his. There's also, of course, the suspicion that he was put up to it. I mean, if he went over to Ukraine, he's fighting in Ukraine. Again, he has contacts not only in the United States government, but also in the Ukrainian government. And maybe there was some sort of a plot there to or encouragement um, from Ukrainian, you know, pro-Ukrainian figures within governments to set him up and kind of help pave the way with other insiders who could help kind of clear him to get him that sort of access. So there's always that conspiratorial plot that may or may not have happened. Um, of course, we can't discount that. We also can't really verify that. But it's certainly, um, you know, this wasn't just some t total whack job. This is a person who did have connections with and, and communications with members of government in American and Ukrainian government. So there is a possibility that there was some sort of a maybe a plot similar to blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline, you know, where it was strategic and. Uh, and then they could just kind of pin it on the guy that's a little bit crazy. And we've seen our government do that in the past where they use these sort of patsies who are mentally ill or slightly unstable. And they set them up, you know, in these uh, where they and then they they usually, you know, the, the stories that we've seen, they've then arrested these people and they act like they're the heroes that they stopped a terror plot. And then we discover as we deep, dig deeper into the terror plot that the FBI completely set it up, right. you know, and that they were baiting the person who wasn't totally mentally, mentally all there. And had the person never came into contact with the FBI, they never would have done what they what they were being charged with doing. So we've seen it from that perspective. Um, I don't think on this perspective, the FBI is going to come out and say, oh, yeah, we totally plotted, you know, we were, you know, we were, we plotted this and planned it and, and, uh, you know, baited the, and trapped this guy into it. But, but because they've done similar things, you know, one could deduce that, well, who knows with this one. Right. I mean, you know, when he was in Ukraine, uh, you know, who knows who may have talked to him and said uh, Trump's going to end this war and Trump's in bed with Putin and all that, you know. Right. Um, but, you know, just overall, when you kind of look at the election and, you know, the hawkishness of Democrats and the hawkishness of Republicans, um, you know, it, it seems as though there's not really a lot of good prospects because, again, you have uh, this push amongst Republicans to support Israel no matter what. And if that means war with Iran, then so be it. And again, obviously, for the last eight years, we've had Democrats being incredibly hawkish towards Russia and uh, this war in Ukraine just escalating more where there, you know, there's an invasion force of Ukrainians inside Russia now. They're approving missile strikes inside of Russia. So it's really reaching the point where things could reach a nuclear war. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, you have Trump and Democrats like uh, RFK and Tulsi who are against that side of it, but it seems as though either one we get, we run the risk of of World War Three, whether it starts in Ukraine or it starts in Iran. Right. Um, th you know, <laughs> it seems as though there really isn't a peace candidate in this election. Yeah, there really isn't. Um, you know, even though Trump and that side, the RFK Trump Tulsi side, talks about making peace with Russia and somehow coming to a conclusion to that conflict. Uh, you're right. They're they're still extremely hawkish when it comes to helping Israel. They're extremely pro-Israel. Trump is undoubtedly the most pro-Israel president this country has ever seen. He did do more for Israel than any other U.S. president has ever done, uh, besides maybe even just the initial, I guess, sanctioning of the uh, or the san you know the um, condoning of the creation of the state. Beyond that. Uh, Trump has done more for the state of Israel than any other president. So that clearly Israel wanting a war with Iran. When Trump was president the first time around, who did he have around him? John Bolton, right? He had a lot of people around him who were extremely hawkish on Iran, in, on Iran, calling for war with Iran. Luckily, Trump never took the bait either. 
One of the things that we could maybe seek some solace in is that maybe Trump wouldn't take that bait again. I think Trump is adverse to getting into conflicts, but I don't think he's adverse to supporting Israel endlessly while they fight the conflict. So I think it's very similar to the Biden administration not wanting to get into a war with Russia, but being totally fine with sacrificing Ukrainians towards that goal. The only difference, the difference is, and this is a main big difference that matters, is that even if Trump has this, this, this uh, maybe noble goal of not dragging Americans into the war and just saying, all right, we'll support you endlessly, Israel. If you want a bunch of weapons, you want a bunch of, you know, we'll give you all the support you need, but we're not going to get involved in this war that you've created over there in the Middle East. Um, Even if he has that idea, the difference between Ukraine and Israel is that Ukraine doesn't have a grasp on our government from the inside. So there's no giant Ukrainian lobby. There's no, um, we don't have politicians on, you know, just in mass, all of them just, I mean, they do, a lot of them do support Ukraine, but it's not coming from There's no like Ukrainian APAC. Right. There's no Ukrainian APAC. They haven't gotten in there. Uh, We don't have a bunch of prominent billionaire Ukrainian Americans who are funding, you know, pro-Ukrainian projects. I mean, there are other wealthy Americans involved and wanting to keep that work going because they're wanting to make a lot of money in Ukraine. So there is certainly that, but it's not as entrenched, nor do they have as much of a grip on our country. Israel does, on the other hand. So even if Trump says, I don't want America to get involved, there's just going to be forces inside of the United States that say, but actually we do want Americans to get involved. And you do need to send troops. You have to support I don't think we would get in right away in the beginning, just like we didn't with Ukraine. But as Ukraine really started to falter and Zelensky started asking for actual troops to help out, I think the difference is with Israel, the United States would end up getting those troops in and saying, we have to, we have to. And I think enough Americans feel differently about Israel than they do about Ukraine. I think American support would be there to go in and actually sacrifice American bodies for Israel's greater project, which is taking a lot more land than what they have right now. So, um, yeah, that, I think the, the the prospect of war with Iran is actually worse than the prospect of war with Russia. Russia is pretty measured also like Iran in a lot of ways. Um, I don't think that the Russian, the war with Russia would go nuclear. I just don't think it would ever get to that point, no matter how many strikes the U.S. hits Russia, you know, allows Ukraine to hit Russia with. I just don't think it'll go nuclear. Um, I think it would escalate. I think it certainly would turn colder with the West and Russia and Russia's allies. Um, But, and and I think maybe Russia would strike some NATO targets, but I don't think it would get to the point of nuclear. So you think even if uh, Russia were to attack NATO members, then that would not result in a nuclear war? No, I don't think either country wants to drop nukes. I just really don't think that there's, they think that they're, that that's worth it. I, Americans don't have that kind of sentiment about Ukraine or even NATO. Uh, a lot of Americans are really like, why are we in NATO? What are we doing in NATO? Israel, on the other hand, has more of a, has more of a prospect of going nuclear because there is an emotional tie to Israel that a lot of Americans have. Um, that tie stemming from childhood or, or thinking about World War II and the atrocities of the Holocaust or wherever that's coming from, I think there's an emotional tie. And in order to get to the point of getting some support for dropping a nuke, you have to have that emotional tie. And I just don't think there's enough Americans who have an emotional tie to Ukraine or NATO to escalate it to the point of nuclear. Hey, Radicals, I hope that you're all enjoying this interview. As you know, this is the start of my spectacular 10th season. This is going to be a big one. We have lots of big returning guests, lots of new guests as well. So really want to make sure that it's great. Please do help support the show if at all possible. You can do that in a few different ways. You can like, comment, and subscribe. Follow me across all different social media networks. And also, if at all possible, please do consider financially supporting the show. You can do that at patreon.com slash primoradical. When you become a patron, you can submit questions to all of my guests. So please do consider that. That's only $1 a month. Please also consider sending super chats and super thanks. And make sure again that you're just following me across all different social media networks. Thanks again, folks, for the last nine years of support. And again, I'm looking forward to making this a great 10th season.
Um, I just want to ask you about the election overall, because, again, this is probably the strangest election cycle we've ever seen, where we have a former president uh, you know, running for his second non-consecutive term, and the incumbent, we were told, was, uh, you know, he was in perfect uh, mental health up until this debate, which was scheduled very early. You know, we never have debates in June. It's typically this time of year. But they scheduled this debate in June, right between the end of the primaries and the, the Democratic convention. And they put it on CNN, which is filled with a bunch of Democrat viewers, right? Like that's yeah. how they did it. It wasn't on Fox, where then the viewers could say, oh, well, Fox, they, they rigged it or they skewed it for Donald Trump. This was just skewed. No, they put it on CNN for all of the liberal voters to watch. And then the, lib and then the liberal voters to say, oh, okay. I guess we do have to replace this guy. Yeah, what a scam. And, you know, with just the way that the media turned on a dime during the debate itself, like a memo went out during the debate, like, okay, he's not our guy anymore. Yeah. And we had him, you know, the weeks following that saying, I'm staying in, I'm staying in. And then just one day, um, magically uh, decided to drop out. Um, but, you know, just all the dynamics, you know, again, RFK, the fact that, you know, he was running and then he ended up supporting Trump. It's just, uh, and the assassination attempts, again, obviously, it's just probably the strangest election cycle in uh, in U.S. history. So <laughs> just wondering if you have any general thoughts on, on this election and maybe if you have any kind of predictions about how this is oh. going to go in November. Oh, boy. Um, okay. Before I get into that, I do want to backtrack for just a second. Um, I, I, I will say when it comes to the war issue with, with Russia and Iran, just real quick, I am historically wrong. I just want to I just want to make this very clear. I am sadly, unfortunately, historically wrong when it comes to me believing that America will have make a good decision. <laughs> so I often think I often give the benefit of the doubt to America a bit and and to my fellow Americans thinking that they're going to make more measured or better decisions. And they prove me wrong every single time. So here I am saying, I don't think it would go nuclear, but I will say I am historically wrong when it comes to thinking that America is gonna actually make a measured or good decision. So I just wanna say that, unfortunately, let's hope this time I'm not wrong <laughs> because this would be devastating. But I was wrong when it came to uh, lockdowns, for example, and vaccine mandates. I really did not believe that America, a country that prides itself and values freedom, I did not think that people would go for that, nor did I think the country would do that. I also didn't think that the Democratic Party would actually swap out Joe Biden with Kamala Harris. I knew they were going to swap him out. I originally thought the plan was to swap them, swap him out with Kamala Harris. Uh, that was always a plan that I had even been saying on my show starting in 20, as soon as uh, before Kamala was even named the VP running mate. Uh, I said on my show at the time, it will be Kamala and their plan is to swap him out with Kamala. That to me was always really clear. What I thought was that after then Kamala became VP and she had literally the lowest ratings ever of any vice president in the history of the United States with a net negative 17 rating, I thought they're going to abandon this plan. They must see that Americans do not like her and they will not swap them out with her. They'll swap them, but maybe with somebody with a little bit more favorability than Kamala Harris. I thought they would, and the reason I thought that is because I naively thought, once again, that maybe they cared one iota about what the voters think, that maybe they would have some sanity and realize it wouldn't be a good idea to just place in a candidate that nobody likes. But I was wrong on that. They did. They didn't care about what Americans thought at all. And they swapped him out with Kamala Harris anyway, which was their original plan. And I was actually really surprised by that. So I'm historically wrong. You know, when I sit here and I have good faith thinking, I have more of a positive outlook. And then they prove me that they're just genuine psychopaths with no actual care or concern about Americans, the health of Americans, that it's all, you know, it's all a game. So um, that being said, you know, we are in a very insane election I think the last time it was this insane, I think it was this insane once before. And I will say it's when Teddy Roosevelt ran in the Bull Moose Party, when he created his own party and ran and he got shot. If you remember, they, there was an assassination attempt and he kept talking, you know, he got shot and he's like, well, let me just continue on my speech. I mean, it was very, you know, Trump has, he's almost like a reincarnated Teddy Roosevelt in some ways where, you know, Teddy got really upset with the Republican establishment 
Uh, Taft was in and Taft was kind of his protege for a while. And then he didn't like the direction Taft was going. And he felt like Taft had become too establishmenty. Um, and so Roosevelt decided to run against Taft and also Woodrow Wilson. And he created the Bull Moose Party in order to in order to run. And it was a, a party that was made up. You know, unfortunately, he wasn't able to grab enough from the Democrat side, from the Woodrow Wilson side, in order to actually make it viable. You know, he ended up splitting the vote between Taft and himself. And so Woodrow Wilson ended up winning. But that was a site that was a crazy election cycle right there with everything that was going on. I mean, a former president going up against a sitting president and then the other guy ended up winning and became president. Um, so I think we're kind of in that time period, almost reincarnated. It's very, very similar. But this is just a nutty election cycle. Uh, gosh, trying to predict <laughs> what's going to happen. My gut instinct from the very beginning is that Democrats are going to win. Well, no, I keep, I keep, I always make this mistake. I say that, and then I have to, I have to reframe this. Democrats will, he'll, that Harris will get, she will be president. Uh, but I. But whether or not they win is up for subjective debate on what that means. Um, I have always been really hesitant to say, oh, elections are not, you know, I, that they're anything other than fair and free and completely transparent and honest. But there is a real derangement that has taken hold of our of our political class and even the voting base. And that is that Trump is an existential threat. They believe him to be a genuine existential threat. And they've tried everything to get rid of the guy. At this point, everything. They've tried everything to get rid of this guy. So I wouldn't put it past them to go a step further. In fact, last night I was in a, um, Oh, like I, I don't even want to bring it up, but I, I shouldn't have ever agreed to it. But I did a debate with Destiny, which I never should have done because he's not a good faith debater. Um, all he does is lob smears and attacks. And he does have a ton of facts that he just rattles off off the top of his head. So it sounds like he's winning because he kind of stumps you with all these facts. But when you actually reassess the entire conversation, one of the points he kept making in the conversation over and over as if he, you know, and this is like his winning argument was that the Democratic Party doesn't need to be Democratic, that it's a corporation. It doesn't matter if people, they don't need to get votes from people, that that's not, that, that it's a private corporation. They could just choose whoever they want. And what they, and, and that's okay because they're doing it in his brain under the guise of protecting democracy. Right. I mean, that was literally his argument that they could instill whoever they want because when they instill that person, that person's going to protect our democracy. So we're going to give up our democracy for this person to protect democracy. And I was like, well, how is that democracy? And he says, well, there's other ways for, you know, democracy isn't just people voting. Well, what's democracy then? But that was his argument. So that's the, so that's a very good characterization of what the, the brain rot inside of the Democratic voting base and the establishment voting base where they believe that even just taking democracy away is helping maintain democracy. It's a, I don't know how they reconcile that in their brains, but that's literally what he kept saying for a solid 20 minutes was, this is the way democracy is protected, by taking away democracy. So I don't put it past them, you know, to ensure Kamala Harris is the next president of the United States, even if that means in their twisted brains taking away democracy in order to protect that democracy. They are saying it out loud. They're championing it. They think it's a good thing. What can be put into the Constitution can slip away from you very quickly. And the greatest example going on right now before our very eyes is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which they're just disappearing with a magic wand as if it doesn't exist, even though it could not be clearer what it's stating. And so, you know, they want to kick it to Congress. So it's going to be up to us on January 6, 2025, to tell the rampaging Trump mobs that he's disqualified. And then we need bodyguards for everybody in civil war conditions, all because the nine justices, not all of them, but these justices who have um, not many cases to look at every no, year, no. not that much work no. to do, a huge staff, great protection, simply do not want 
to do their job and interpret what the great 14th Amendment means. And I'm glad that Sherilyn's creating her new center so we can bring that. So my prediction, my gut instinct is Kamala will be president. I And one way or another, and it actually doesn't matter the support that Trump gets or the lack of support Harris has or what her policies are, or, you know, none of it really matters. Kamala has it in the bag. Well, I think we can probably rest assured that no matter what happens, that there's going to be, um, you know, some legal cases or demonstrations or, you know, uh, talks about uh, certification of the vote on January 6th again. I think it's going to, um, you know, it's going to definitely be controversial no matter how it goes. Well, and there, there's at that point then a big push to demonize Iran, right? Like Iran did it. Iran did it. So now America has to hate Iran. And half the country will hate Russia and the other half will hate Iran because they'll try to pin it on them. And, and we'll go to war with both. <laughs> right, exactly. And then we'll be at war with both. So then everybody wins Compromise. on both sides, right? <laughs> right. Um, well, Kim, I really appreciate you uh, being on the show today and, and going through all of this. Um, you know, again, it's it's just a crazy uh, election cycle and crazy news cycle right now. So I appreciate you uh, kind of helping walk through all of it. Um, for folks out there who would like to follow you and support you, how can they do that? Yeah, I'm on. I, I do a show on Rumble exclusive uh, an hour Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. I do that show. I'm on vacation right now, but I'll be back on, on Monday. And then, um, uh, yeah, and then I, I do post clips on YouTube. So I'm always I always can be found there. But if you just go to Kim Iverson show dot com, that'll take you right to my Rumble show to watch every day. Awesome. Well, thanks again for your time. I really do appreciate it. And hopefully I can have you back on sometime soon. Yeah, thank you.